Welcome back to Herberger Online Office Hours for the summer of 2020. Uh, this is where the goal is to bring together faculty members and instructional designers to talk about relevant issues in teaching and learning in higher ed and online education. I'm Tim McKean. I'm an instructional designer with the Herberger Institute of the Arts and Design at ASU. And let's meet our participants today. I'll go. My name is Justin Schuel. I work with Tim at Herberger Online. I'm a educational technologist slash web app developer, instructional designer. I kind of do all three. Um, and I'm really excited to participate today. Hi, I'm Ken Brooks. I'm a professor in the design school. I'm a landscape architect. I teach in the landscape architecture and urban design programs. Um, I'm also the director of the PhD program in the design school. And um, most of my instructional activity uh, is with graduate students. Hi, I'm Joya Scott. I am a um, faculty member in the former School of Film, Dance, and Theater, soon to be reorganized. Um, I teach primarily undergraduates, actually, so flip side from what Ken said. Um, I uh, teach, um, I'm based primarily in theater, but I also teach several multidisciplinary classes, um, including uh, a fully online asynchronous course in um, what's essentially an acting appreciation class. Um, and uh, I also teach in person or to, heretofore in person um, courses uh, in uh, first year seminar that's focused on multidisciplinary collaboration, communication, project management, and conflict management skills, as well as experimental theater and a few other things, depending on the semester. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay. William, you can introduce yourself. Go ahead, Bill. Okay. Thank you. Um, I thought I was an expert. That's fine. Um, I'm Bill Partland. I teach in the School of uh, Now Music, Dance, and Theater. I teach uh, directing for the stage and acting for the stage, um, and also serve as the artistic director for the season of performances that we do in the theater program. Um, and uh, my classes are all in person uh, until about mid-spring. I had never taught online at all, so I feel like I'm still in the learning process of, of that. And it's great to see Joya here, who's got experience in both of these, because the specific class I want to learn a little bit more about is one that she has taught when she was my MFA student in directing. And so I'm going to uh, lean on you a little bit, Joya, to kind of suggest potential ways to teach differently from the way we do it in person for some of the things I'm trying to get across. And Bishoy. OK. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Shoya Adel uh, from Egypt. Uh, now I work at the Bank Master. I work at the microfinance department. Uh, but I have a plan to join in learning and development. So uh, first, uh, yeah, and first uh, I studied learning and development uh, as academic courses. And now uh, so looking forward to uh, get more experience about uh, instruction design. Great. Well, it's wonderful to have you all uh, with us today. Uh, it's exciting. I think this is the most faculty we've had so far. So it's going to be a, a bring a lot more to that side of the conversation. Um, so the resources we looked at this week focused on the blending of different types of education. And historically, we've had in-person classes. We've had online classes, and then there was this blend uh, called hybrid in which some of the material would be in person and some of the material would be online. Uh, but now we're even starting to create new blends of that in which we're blending synchronous, in which all, all participants act together at the same time, and asynchronous, which is more like an on-demand model. Um, and so we're starting to blend that as well, in addition to the fact that some online and in person. What were, um, Ken, what was one of your, your, your 
first impressions or main takeaways are from that idea of blending synchronous and asynchronous instruction? Well, I, I have, um, I have been doing asynchronous teaching for over 40 years. We used to call it read a book and come back and talk to me about it. Um, I've had office hours, which is asynchronous learning. Um, I, I uh, started using internet for what I considered um, enrichment in traditional face-to-face -face classes. Um, back in the in the 90s where I considered that what I delivered was augmented enrichment to a course and um, it wasn't the primary content there may have been a lot of material there and some of it may have been assigned but it supplemented and complemented what was going on in a traditional class. So I, I have not taught um, until this spring in what would be considered remote learning. Um, though, you know, I used to send my students emails uh, from 2,000 miles away um, expecting them to use that information in assignments that they had when I wasn't in the classroom, but it wasn't their primary expectation. It was an enrichment detail, uh, situation. So this spring, uh, when we went remote, um, I was teaching two courses. One of them had PhD students only, and one of them had half masters and half PhD students. And I can say that for a full half of a semester, I had 100% participation. Uh, and um, so I, I felt like our experience was very good. Most of what I teach is not what most people think that the design school teaches. Um, most of people think that the design school teaches in traditional design studios with a tremendous amount of interaction between um, an instructor as a principal critic working with students doing hands-on design with interaction in that studio. And so, um, I did participate in a number of uh, faculty juries of students who were doing traditional design work, but I wasn't their uh, principal instructor during that recent time. So um, my, my primary interest is to figure out best strategies for delivering remote learning um, during our uh, near future, um, and I'm I'm still a bit skittish about what I have seen as the most common forms of um, asynchronous lecture courses. Um, I'm not very interested in canning a bunch of recorded lectures and asking students independently to go watch, review, uh, and then come back and take a test to prove that they learned something. In, in my way of thinking, it's just adding electrons to asking students to go read the book and come back and take a test. And um, I, most of my career has really been about me being able to engage live students doing real thinking at the same time and interacting with other students with their peers doing that thinking. And yes, we ask students to do some things um, independently and alone, but that augments the experience that they do in, in, the, in the classroom or that they could do in synchronous um, online 
uh, conferencing. So that's that's where my thinking is at this point is um, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the best ways to deliver what I think is going to be primarily organized around synchronous engagement mm -hmm. and then complement that with asynchronous enrichment. But the asynchronous part is not a replacement for some of the traditional face-to-face -face part. Yeah, I, I like your comment about the fact that, uh, that you've been doing asynchronous <laughs> from the beginning, right? Um, I think it was probably back around 2007 when the idea of the flipped classroom started getting some traction. And, uh, and I remember talking to some of my courses, I was in the, in the classroom at the time and talking to my graduate students saying, higher ed has been doing this already. You know, we send students to go read something or study something or watch something and then come to class and let's talk about it. We call it a seminar, you know? Right. Um, and so that idea wasn't new. What's changed is the, the ease of doing that um, with video and, and with younger students. You know, with, you know, for high school students, middle school students, the ability for those instructors and those students to, to access a, a recording has changed. Um, but the concept of preparing for class and then coming prepared and then participating in a, in a high quality interaction is not a new concept at all. And I like your, your, your comment about um, the synchronous engagement, that that's exactly what uh, the, that synchronous time is for. Well, I, I'd like to think that of all of the things that the university pays me to do, the most important thing that they pay me for is for the experience that students have when they interact with me, and that that's enriched also by the experience that I have with my interacting with my peers. Mm -hmm. um, we could all go to our caves or our ivory towers and write papers and read things and take tests and, and, and make a million videos, but um, why don't we just subscribe to that online? Wasn't that what the great book series was supposed to do? Yeah. Other thoughts? That's something that I've always tried to do in my online teaching is sort of replicate that in-class experience. Um, my background is in teaching language, teaching English in particular. So I try to, um, when, I'm, when I'm teaching with students, you know, we want to utilize our class time most effectively by um, having them actually practice the language. In teaching here in the US, they get a lot of practice outside of class because we're, you know, they're in an Im immersion setting. But when I was teaching overseas in the Middle East, um, for example, they are in my class for an hour a day or you know two hours a day using English and they go outside and they're using their native language again and they aren't getting any practice except in my classroom so it's so that interaction between them and using English in class is really um, was really important and then moving that online trying to replicate that experience and that interaction um, you know and so now with Herberger when I'm designing courses that's you know if there's anything that's just kind of an individual type activity um, those are the things that we're like okay go watch this um, you know go watch this video lecture or go read this chapter in the book then come and let's have a, a, a good discussion on it um, you know and in the case of the remote teaching we've been doing that's the bulk of what my um, classes are is me answering questions about the material and um, you know doing discussion I hardly ever lecture anymore um, so I agree with what uh, um, he was saying before Bill I saw you on mute you had something to say there too just a sort of an uh a variation on that that Joya will know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, so, and, and I think I mentioned this to you, Tim, when we talked. Um, I'm curious as to the efficacy of an approach I normally take in the classroom that I think will translate into the medium of Zoom, but I'd love to just walk it through um, because it really is, uh, it's synchronous. And my question has to do more with um, 
should I be thinking of it as asynchronous in, in one form? So normally in my class, at the beginning of this introduction to the art of directing, essentially, um, what I start with is a historical perspective on the rise of the position of a director for theater, because it's only about 200 years old that that term has ever even been used in theater from the Greeks and, the, uh, and Shakespeare's all time, they didn't have anyone called a director. So I do a, a sort of a, a, a two week, which means really four classes process with my students of asking them to read uh, uh, a text, which is, is one of the best um, descriptions of that historical process, but it's also was written in the 1950s. So I know that most of my students will look at some of that language and go, Huh? What? They have never heard these words. Um, so I ask them to read it. I normally then follow it with an in-class uh, um, PowerPoint in which I cover that material that they've read about, highlighting eventually uh, the specific movements uh, that have led to the position of the director and at its current level. That, that engenders a discussion with the class a little bit. And then what I tend to do is assign it's a, it's a class of only about 20 students. And so I will assign five different teams, basically, to take a segment of that historical time period and research it themselves, and then come and teach half of the next class, each group teaching, taking half of the next class, to explain further the, the period of time that they specifically were asked to research. Um, so, that, that has worked reasonably well. Um, uh, and this is a required class, so these are not students who are fascinated by this topic necessarily. Um, so my question is, is there a value, uh, since my, my PowerPoint the discu discussion of this topic does take most of a class, would it make any sense to try to pre-record that PowerPoint for them to see whenever they want to um, and then open up the class for discussion of that before the assignment of individual um, periods within that overall perspective. Uh, or in other words, is there a way I should think of it differently that might use asynchronous um, recording of, of a PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think there is value in, um, if you are identifying components that are in your live class, that are largely you talking, um, then, then there is value, I think, in pre-recording those and making that an asynchronous activity. Um, to go back to Ken's point, uh, and, your, and your phrase was, you know, that, that synchronous engagement, that we don't, wanna, we don't wanna replace the synchronous experience, we wanna maximize it. We want, and I was, I was talking to another instructor this morning, you know, anytime that you ask a student to be at a certain place or at a certain time, they're paying some cost for that. You know, they had to drive, they had to get time off work, they had to get a babysitter, they had to whatever, they had to get dressed. I don't know. There's some cost, small or large. Um, if, we're, if we're not maximizing that time and making that cost, uh, honoring that, that cost, uh, then, then I think we're doing it wrong. So if there is some, if there's a, if there's a, a synchronous session where uh, I, as the instructor, am, am mostly speaking, then I think that's a poorly used synchronous time. Uh, we want to have synchronous time be dialogue, be uh, debate, be um, engagement, be uh, role playing, be active learning things. Um, and so if we can seed that with uh, a pre-recorded uh, lecture or a reading assignment or watching a video from another uh, industry expert or, or worldwide um, authority and then really maximize that synchronous time. I think that's what, um, I think that's what hybrid is all about. I think that's what um, making that kind of blend of online um, and, and synchronous um, is, is all about. It's about respecting everybody's time, the instructor's time and the student's time. And it's about really making use of that precious time with our students so that we're, we're engaging them during that 100% of that time, not, not maybe half of that time. Then, so I'm going to ask at some point um, how to go about either on Zoom or on Canvas or in some other way 
how I might yeah. make such a, a recording of, of a PowerPoint. Yeah, Ken had more to add there too. Uh, Bill, your, your um, exploration on how to help students engage certain material leads to another of the instructional strategies that I've wrestled with for many years. And it, it has nothing to do with technology. It has to do with the peer-to-peer -peer interaction of the students uh, around the concept of collaboration. What work is most appropriate for students to collaborate on and what is most appropriate for independent work. Um, synchronization facilitates collaboration. Asynchronous is antithetical to collaboration. Uh, doesn't mean it can't happen, but what has to happen if you collaborate asynchronously is that you have to have micro synchronization amongst the collaborators. But um, in, in my advanced classes, I often spend time with the students saying that there is a sub agenda beyond whatever the topical content of the course is, which has to do with the way students take responsibility for managing their own learning. And um, we talk about a role for collaboration and we, and we point to examples that almost any complex problem solving can in fact lead to better solutions with collaboration. And so what I often do with a number of my exercises is set up what I'll call the information gathering and processing as collaborative ventures and then the application of the, of the synthesized information is a resource to the whole class for independent uh, demonstration of application. So uh, I'll take Bloom's taxonomy and we'll work the bottom half of the pyramid collaboratively trying to save time and maximize efficiency and consider all of that material input so your two weeks of studying the background is the information gathering that all of those students have to do such that when they later uh, become prepared to, to develop their own uh, director's plan for engaging a new project, they can draw on those resources and they didn't have to do all of the reading and all of the synthesis necessary in order to get those resources. Right. I'm with you up. Joy, you had something to, me. to add there? Yes, Gary, yeah. it's on you. Yeah, um, sorry, I heard, I was hard to hear for a second. Um, I, uh, I was had a couple thoughts listening to what y'all were sharing and, and also in thinking about it in relationship to um, the article that Tim pointed us to. Um, it seems like what Bill is proposing about, about shifting what can be asynchronous to asynchronous is even more imperative now because the, you know, any synchronous time, given the pressures that are on our students at the moment, um, is even more precious, I think, maybe than it was six months ago, um, and even more scarce, perhaps. And also, the additional, like, enabling a high flex model, I think, is just going to, like, I was reading through these different scenarios, and I think I'm, I'm excited about it in some ways. I think that I love the accessibility um, increase that, that a high flex model um creates i think one of the challenges is the time spent negotiating all of the different subgroups of students the asynchronous uh students the synchronous but remote mm -hmm. students and the in-person students right that just is going to cause like that's just going to take time right 
and that time is going to be part of the class time that we're allotted. <laughs> you know, it, it just will, and we can do what we can to be, make it efficient, but, um, and we should, but I think yeah. that um, it's a big, it's a big issue, a big uh, a challenge that we're going to face. So because of that, like finding efficiencies in how we use our time by moving things to async when they can be, um, seems even more important <laughs> given that challenge. And the other thing I was thinking about, um, let me just find my thought again. Um, this is this is really pushing us, I think, to do what the students have been ha have wanted for a long time in, in 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 many ways. You know, their impatience with lecture content. Um, you know, I have mixed feelings. I think that sometimes a lecture can be a really exciting if the lecturer is good at lecturing. Um, it can be really exciting and dynamic and I've seen students who claim that they don't like lectures enjoy really good lectures. So I know that it's, so I think what they don't like is boring lectures, but, and, and perhaps um, for some, you know, folks, long lectures are tough, but I do think that, um, that when you're invested in the content and the lecturer is doing, is a dynamic performer, I mean, we all watch comedy. We all, well, we don't all, but a lot of our students watch stand up, they watch uh, monologue, you know, they watch storytellers. It's not that they'd hate being talked at. Uh, it's that they hate being talked at <laughs> in a way that's not interesting. <laughs> so I think, um, so I think that that, you know, and there are times when I stand in front of the classroom and think, you know, it's not my job to entertain you. Mm -hmm. But on my more generous days, I recognize that we have to meet, we have to meet them in the middle on that. Um, and so thinking about, I think sometimes like when we move things to asynchronous, we have the opportunity to look at that content and figure out how to make it more engaging than we might have made it in, in person. Um, and that's an opportunity. Um, yeah, I think that was what I wanted to say. There was one other thought yeah. that I'm losing, but I'll, I'll bring it up again later if I remember it. No, it's not our job to entertain, but it is our job to engage. And I think if we can make a distinction yeah. between those things, then that helps to, to mm -hmm. kind of, it's a, it's a nuance for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And I want to add that most of the PowerPoints I do, and I don't do very many of them in these classes, um, but most of them are rather short and have built in uh, ways in which I do engage my students. I essentially ask them questions or get them to talk about uh, uh, issues or, or whatever that are part of the of the PowerPoint that sort of that's all built in. But this first one is, as Joya knows, just packed with information and we'll cover it once and then it will essentially become part of their understanding of the history of theater. Um, so, so in this case, this one is the one that feels like if I can do it asynchronously, then I can uh, and, and I like the idea, Joy, you just mentioned of being able to watch it myself and go, oh boy, that's really dull. Like, <laughs> yeah. When you're doing it, it's, it doesn't seem dull because you're doing it. Uh, yeah, so, of course. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so it's a good, it's a good thought. You know, I wonder, Bill, it, it also might, for that particular class, just knowing the curriculum a little bit, I wonder if you could chunk out the history portion into smaller bits and have like every unit so that for this, because I know that for, especially for some of our students who really thrive on the practical side of the arts and you know they're really um not super interested naturally in the history there's some who love it but but i know that it's a tough sell for some of them so i wonder if every unit has like a little chunk of history you know a mini mini lesson on you know on the historical background that maybe informs the practical um exercises you're doing in that unit so they can see that connection and it also isn't a whole bunch of history right at the beginning when you're really working hard to get their interest. Um, that's just one idea, like if it can be separated out, because I think that, you know, you can do, a, if I'm not wrong, you can do a lot of the practical exercises of the class without actually knowing the history already, right? Correct, yeah. yes. I mean, and, and it'll be tough to necessarily connect some of those historical um, m movements, shall we say, uh, to the specific things that we do in the class for exercise. But in a couple of yeah. cases, the, the later cases where we're talking about Stanislavski and other major yeah. forces in it, there are definitely aspects of those lectures that, of that particular part of the history that would apply instantaneously to um, action verbs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. yeah. 
Bill, is there exercises that you could do relatively early that would not require um, a comprehensive understanding of the history that a student could engage in and then could discover that history empowers a greater impact? Um, that you then uh, go back and explicate something from history that shows how this happened. How do we, what's the science behind the magic um, there? And then that helps engage the students with an expectation that maybe history has a reason and a purpose and a value beyond merely getting your boxes checked in order to get through this part of the course. Uh, potentially, yes. Sometimes I'd like to come back. A, yeah, that's essentially what I was imagining and suggesting. And, and, and to some degree, yes, although the earliest part of the history, I, I would hit early on just because in a certain way, all of it adds up to what we, where we are now, which is why I tend to teach it first. I'd like to come back to Ken's comment about being skittish about um, pre-recording lectures uh, and, and the idea of that replacing uh, the synchronous component. Um, and then come back to Joya's comment about, about what the classroom might look like in the fall. But, but can, can you see um, like what, what Bill was talking about, a pre-recorded lecture uh, possibly uh, enhancing the experience in the synchronous moment? Well, I, I could. Um, and that's not to say that I haven't uh, made or and delivered a pre-recorded lecture before. Um, I, I have a sense that um, based on some of Joya's comments that um, a classroom, a live classroom experience can help enrich the experience and the learning outcome, even if the content and the delivery is the same. That the technology has an opportunity to make an excellent lecture even better and to make a mediocre lecture even worse. Um, and that if, if we're inclined to have content that the student didn't necessarily choose to sign up as their favorite class, then they're already predisposed to say, well, so what are you going to do for me to really capture my attention? And then what we do is we package it into um, this digital version of the same thing. And essentially what we're, we're doing is going back and getting black and white reruns. Uh, to people who have been to the live show. And I, I guess, you know, I, I sometimes worry that um, uh, my, my skills as an on-film actor giving a lecture are, are not my strength. And I know that when I lecture, I, I'll have an outline and I'll have materials but I'm engaging with students in the lecture and I don't give the same lecture the same way every time. And so to presume that I could get to and find the ideal lecture and get it ideally recorded is uh, making the presumption that the students are gonna be as static as the lecture are, is. And I'd like to think that things that happen in the classroom or that things that have happened in the news um, surrounding the student's context of where they are, are part of that experience to help make it real. Mm -hmm. And so I worry about um, designing the perfect lecture being stale as soon as it's recorded. Yeah. And, and I think, and and I think part of that concern is stale is to make it more magical. And of course, I don't have um, uh, 
industrial light and magic behind me to do the animation necessary yeah. to deliver what I'd, what I'd love to do, you know. Um, mm -hmm. it, I taught half of my career with a chalkboard and chalk. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to make that get animated other than the choreographer, choreography by the instructor. That's the true black and white rewrite. rewrite. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. And I think, and I think the important thing to think about there is that we're not um, using asynchronous things in most cases. I mean, it, when we're talking about I courses, O courses, completely online on classes, yeah, we are using asynchronous activities to, to replace a synchronous thing. Um, but when we're talking blended, when we're talking hybrid or when we're talking um, high flex or, or sync or any of these things that may happen in the fall, um, we're really talking about using them to augment and to supplement. Um, and so th the idea is not that you have to replace the engagement that you do in class um, in a recording, but that the recording is about uh, those portions that are, the, that are legitimately just direct instruction. Like I have information that I need to get you. And you know, if we look historically, you know, you always wonder, why did lecture become such a big thing? Why is it this huge behemoth that we're still, you know, thousands of years after formal in, uh, education has begun? Why are we still fighting with this idea? And the reason is because it's an efficient way for me to give my information to lots of people is to tell them all at once, right? right. That's more efficient than writing it. That's more efficient than writing letters and sending it to them. The easiest way for one person to get information to a thousand people is to tell them. Everybody gather and I'll tell you. Um, and that was great, you know, going all the way back to Greek times, that's how learning happened. Um, the, the thing that's changed is it's become easier now. I can reach more than a thousand people by recording and, and posting it. Um, and, it and, and, and it's become easier to the point that with, um, you know, uh, a, a reasonable expense of equipment in my house, I can make decent looking videos and you can hear me and I can talk to you. And so that dynamic has changed a little bit about what's the easiest way for me to get information from one person to a thousand people isn't necessarily to gather them in the same place anymore. Um, and especially right now, I mean, and, and, and especially in the fall, um, where gathering people in the same place is the hardest thing in the world right now um, and, and getting information out. So I think it's, it's important to, to make that distinction between engagement, definitely synchronous is, is most engaging, uh, the, but the distribution of information is a little bit different than, than engagement. And, and I'll acknowledge, Ken, that um, you know, when, we, when we have a two hour, three hour lecture class, something like that, it's never three hours of lecture, it's 20 minutes of lecture, 10 minutes of question and answer, 10 more minutes of lecture, 14, you know, 40 minutes of discussion. It's never that, you know, and, and, and when we are designing an online course, and, and that's where my background comes in, you know, we, we identify all those components and break them out and put them into the course strategically um, so that the same experience or the, the equivalent um, experience is happening, but broken up into pieces. Um, I'm going to jump right on in uh, quickly, Tim, to ask, so if I were to decide that I should do an asynchronous uh, version of a PowerPoint lecture, do I have with a, a, an iMac, a MacBook Pro computer mm -hmm. of several years old, about five years old, do I have already the equipment uh, capable of recording such a thing or do I need something else beyond the equipment? You have that already, yeah. So you could use QuickTime to do a screen recording. Uh, that'll record everything on your screen and your, your microphone. And then you just open up PowerPoint like you would in class and, and just go. Yeah, I think, I think when, when screen recording became a thing, again, and this is like mid 2000s, late 2000s, when the screen recording became something that was accessible to everybody and it started to become more ubiquitous, I think that changed for me, that changed how I was able to teach because now anything that I could do in the classroom, you know, anything that I would put on a projector, let's say, and show to students in a classroom, I could now capture that and show it to students through the internet. And, and that when, when I realized that, that anything I can teach to students um, in class that I would put on a screen, I can now capture. Um, 
I, I started doing that. I started capturing my class sessions and making that available uh, for you know students that were missing or students that just needed to review. I had a lot of international students at the time and they loved the fact that they could go back and re-listen to our conversations because they weren't having to you know, focus so much on translating everything, everything perfectly in real time. Um, when I was teaching middle school, you know, any given day you have, I, I taught middle school, I taught eight classes a day, you know, any given class has one or two people absent, that's between eight and 16 absent students every day um, that need to get caught up at some, some way, right? And watching a recording of what we had talked about was a good way for them to do that. So just recording what I was already doing in class, it's not a best practice for developing an online class, but it's certainly a, a step in, the, in that direction and, and a step in providing the equal access uh, to our course material um, that, that, we would, that we really need to, by law, uh, provide and, and that we want to by, you know, by the nature of, of being educators. Let's go back to Joya's comment also about um, what the classroom might look like in fall, because we've talked a lot about um, that blend of uh, synchronous and asynchronous in a, in a hybrid course and in a, in a traditional hybrid course. Uh, but what we may see in fall is even in those synchronous experiences, we may have local students and remote students. We may have physical students and virtual students interacting in the same space. Um, and that's one of the things that the idea of the high flex is about giving students some choice and some agency in how they want to engage in the course. Um, but we're also in a, in a place now where some students may not have a choice. Some students may be able to come back to campus. We know that a lot of international students may not be able to come back to campus. Uh, student visas are not being renewed. Travel bans have not yet been lifted. Um, and depending on how family structures are, you know, they need to, may need to be caring for family members or the way the economy is, people may need to be working. Um, what are your thoughts about this idea of, of engaging physical and remote students in the same synchronous session? Uh, for me, that would be uh, much to be desired in a number of ways. Uh, and I'm, I've been thinking about, well, even whoever is uh, available, I teach in a studio that would, would allow social distancing for probably 10 of the 20 students that will be in the class at a time. Mm -hmm. So if I had the capability, uh, I break them into smaller groups that collaborate together on each of the exercises we do and ultimately they collaborate on creating and rehearsing a, a, a specific scenes from specific play. Um, mm -hmm. So there are certain ways I could if, take a 20, student class and if uh, there's a way to include a, the class distantly through video uh, watching what's going on in the classroom then i could potentially split the class in half and on on each day of, of the two days uh, split between the two if even if all of them are available um, but for distancing purposes we need to try to keep a, a, a wider distance then for me, that idea would certainly uh, work rather well for much of what I do in my class. Yeah, and that's and that is one of the the models that that is being tossed around is that that some students, uh, you know, having a reduced number of physical students, and and I don't know how that's going to be determined, um, but being able to give. Everybody, an equivalent experience, I think, is important. It's really important to me that uh, remote students aren't don't get the feeling of being a second second class experience. Um, and I think that's that's something that that we're going to be releasing some training soon, and and something that we're working on developing some techniques for how do you in, engage those remote students uh, to have this similar or uh, equivalent kind of experience. Right, and my, my thinking about it is most of my students from what I'm looking at my class list, I, I believe most of them are either local or, or can be physically available in the classrooms, but I won't know that until too late. So I, I love advice and information about how I can uh, mitigate for students who might never be able to make it to the physical classroom. Uh, that, that, that information would be 
particularly important in these studio classes in which interaction and physical, uh, the physical life of actors on a stage working with a director who's staging things in a physical space in three dimensions, all of those are rather important to the, um, to the experience of directing. And Zoom is never gonna be able to do that. Zoom becomes, how do I do television directing with only one camera? Um, and, and, and my cast not even all in the same place. So I, right. I, I think of all of those uh, things as, as those are gonna be important ways for me to try to be thinking about how to make this experience as universally valuable as possible. Yeah, that makes me, you know, it's interesting. I feel like we have to prepare for so many different possible contingencies right now. You know, I'm imagining a world where, you know, if the outbreak continues to rise in Arizona, which it is currently at the moment, you know, there we may face a fall where we can't even have small groups. And then the question is, okay, how do we, how do we best use that time and make sure that, you know, even if they're not getting out of it, what we originally hoped were the learning outcomes for the particular course, how do we, um, how do we imagine at least parallel learning outcomes that we can do through remote, fully remote, um, or that can be toggled back and forth between remote and small group meetings if that ends up being possible, et cetera. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm having trouble imagining a world, honestly, where I'm going to feel super comfortable having students get together and act out a scene in close proximity in, in a few months. You know, it, it probably, I mean, I'm not a public health expert, obviously, and I, I really hope we get some official and evidence-backed guidance on this stuff from the university soon. But, you know, if, if my students are performing a scene in class and, you know, it requires them to get up in each other's faces, which most scenes do, because let's be real, theater is interesting when people fight uh, or at least argue or uh, fall in love, et cetera, right? You know, I there's got to be some conflict, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, that may not be possible. So then the question is like, you know, I'm thinking like, are there ways to teach proxemics, for instance, through uh, a digital 3D modeling. God, I don't know. Maybe there's some stage picture work that they can do, you know, even if they can't do, uh, you know, doubling down on thinking about imagery and stage pictures and design collaboration and research maybe is the pivot, then maybe this semester they get less of that hands-on moving actors in space in real time thing, which sucks on one level to be perfectly blunt and pardon my French, but it, it, it may just be the world we have to live in. And, and on that uh, uh, score, certainly what I found Joya, in my two directing classes last term, uh, students start to, start to get very good at things like figuring out visual backgrounds, virtual backgrounds for sure. the scenes that they were doing and, and they could simulate on, on camera confrontations. And yeah. so oddly enough, uh, as I say, that's why I was suddenly teaching television directing with a single camera and right. two remote locations. Uh, yeah. There were still things to be gotten out of it, but not the standard things that I would normally yes. teach in an intro to directing class. Yeah. Yeah, and you bring up a good point, Joya, about um, that, you know, things that we did in class, we might not be able to completely reproduce them in, in a virtual way. Uh, but figuring out how to meet the same learning objectives in a different way. It, it, coming back to that idea of objectives, what are we really trying to get the students to learn by doing this exercise? If I can't do that specific exercise, what other things could they do and get that similar experience or meet that same learning goal? Um, and that's gonna be an, an important step for a lot of people to take of, okay, the rules have changed, but the learning objectives haven't changed, right? The, what I want students to learn from my course hasn't changed. Um, how do I still meet those goals? And, and, and honestly, uh, Tim, that's exactly what I'm working through these classes, trying to figure out, okay, what's the substitute? Because I, like Joya, I'm a pessimist, and I essentially think that the combination of opening that's going on in Arizona and the rise in cases, and on top of that, the demonstrations with large crowds of people, uh, I think is going to pro probably put us in a worse situation in the fall than we're in right now or than we were in the spring, even it's potentially that way. So I guess I'm preparing for the worst uh, with the knowledge that anything better than the worst, I know I can deal with that. And 
maybe the silver lining is is that this offers you know this is sort of tagging off something Ken mentioned earlier, but it offers us a chance to um, both do ourselves and lead our students through a degree of metacognition about how we're dividing up and imagining teaching and learning, how we're how we're identifying outcomes, how we're organizing our work. You know, I think that um, our students benefit when we take the time, and this has been my experience over the last 11 years, to talk about why we're learning what we're learning and why we're learning it the way we're learning it. And um, because often that is opaque to them unless it's made explicit. I've discovered in ways that I, I did not realize when I first started teaching. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm thinking about ways of using this as an opportunity to make transparent and to also encourage the student, my process with the students, and then also encourage the students to um, think about their own work in that in that more critical way and to, to, to engage because those are skills they need to learn anyway for their own lives lives right and their own careers um, thinking about how to engage them and thinking about okay y'all so you're going to work on this collaborative project make sure as you sit down to organize your work on this project that you've divided up the work between things that you really can talk about over chat or email or asynchronous means and what are the things that you really need to have real time dialogue about you know that's something that for my class that's about multidisciplinary collaboration that's already something that i felt like i needed to include because i felt like a lot of the students honestly they default this this generation defaults to asynchronous chat stuff I mean, sometimes it happens to be synchronous, right? But texting is like, when I see it, I respond or I don't. Um, and they they are very comfortable in that medium and they assume that a lot can get done in that medium without necessarily thinking critically about what are the things we really need to talk about in person or at least in real time. So I'm thinking about how can we incorporate into all of our exercises that moment, uh, that sort of meta step where the students have some agency in determining like, what are the things that we want to do in real time? What are the things that we can do on our own? Yeah. Which is the essence of collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Joya, one of the things that I sometimes reflect on is how we've been able to use technology to move students to higher level problem solving. And I can use sure. as yep. one of the most, uh, elementary examples, word processing. Um, way back 40 years ago, when we asked students to prepare uh, a written description of something, we hoped they did a good job and we marked it up, but we never took something from a student and said, nice first draft, now think about how you integrate this, do that, and have the students rework that and take it to a higher level because they don't have to wrestle with the mechanism of getting uh, words on paper. That is so, so simplified by the right. word processor that we can move to the higher level thinking. And, and we do the same thing in drawing and visualization of environments in design. But um, I, I now will ask students to find examples of things in the built environment and document it with their cell phones and then come back and show, p p paste the imagery into a Word document with labels and arrows reporting what they saw, why it's critical and how to make it better or why it's good or bad. And so, um, when you're teaching a principal, you may be able to have the student actually synthesize a virtual situation with their cell phone cameras or, or other things. You may actually be able to do some staging with pipe cleaner people and, and cell phone cameras and, and do the analytics of the proximics that you were talking about that you would have done right in front of the classroom with four students. And that and that kind of activity could, uh, you know, give more people the chance to be in charge, per se, you know, 
I'm, I'm also thinking about Lego, you know, Lego figures of, of, of working on these stagings and, and blockings, essentially, I guess. Uh, I don't know um, theater as well as, as you two do, obviously. But if, that, if that's a similar thing to what kind of you're talking about. Um, but, but in a simulation with toys or with pipe cleaners or any kind of uh, figures like that, it gives everybody the chance to to move people around and and practice you know try different uh configurations and, and get that experience uh where if it's in class uh, some people are just kind of following instructions and, and not making those choices and um so that might be an, an interesting dynamic to that um as a side note one of the work streams i'm i'm involved with here at asu is the creative fluency work stream kind of looking at what that idea of a creative fluency is and how do we support and 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 build creative fluency on campus and the more research i do into the idea of creativity uh, the more it comes down to students making choices people making choices when you make a choice for a purpose that's creativity if you're just following instructions then you're just building um, lego is a good example of that if you're just building the thing that came with the kit and following the instructions are you being creative? Um, but if you changed it to have nine wheels instead of three or, you know, that kind of thing, now you're making a choice for a reason and, and, and that kind of crosses that barrier. So that, that, that kind of stuck in my mind of if more people are making more choices, then there's, there's more uh, processing happening. So I just want to add to that point of view, Tim. In some ways, that's why I wouldn't want to use Legos or, uh, or pipe cleaners for blocking purposes, because too many of our high school teachers think that blocking is about telling people where to go and when to move and, and how to stand, right. whereas the actual process for, for directors in the profession and, and the real world is that actors acting in the role, having understood what the character wants, choose when and where to move with some guidance from the director. But part of the process is the collaborative process of discovering within the character a mm -hmm. need to move here or not be here right now or confront right now. So what I want to get away from, honestly, is any manipulation from, uh -huh. you know, from the point of view. So, uh, so it's a tricky, uh, it is the trickiest aspect because too many of our students come into the university with someone who's, who's done it wrong for mm -hmm. a while that that's what they're used to is oh I'm, i get told where to go and then i go do that right yeah that's definitely an issue i i one thing i'm working on a zoom production now um my my own creative work and and one of the things that we've been talking about is um you know is there a way to kind of find those impulses at least by using mobile cameras like can phones right smartphones so um, by liberating the actor from sitting behind a computer at a desk, we can actually, you know, it, they are not shared, it's, it's not shared space, right? So it's a very different thing and it's never going to be the same thing. But I do think, you know, um, my, my friend and co collaborator um, just uh, directed a, a staged reading of Three Sisters that um, was uh, totally on Zoom. And they found some, they, he gave um, mobile cameras to, the three sisters and Natasha, and, and they found really interesting ways to use their remote spaces to act on those impulses. And that was just in a reading. So I'm, I'm wondering if there are ways to explore that. I mean, it's, it's again, this is not our, our first choice solution for teaching live right. theater, but it is maybe a way to at least give the students a feel of what responding to those impulses through movement is, even if they're doing it in their own bedrooms. Right, and I'm exploring that with the director of uh, Machos, our first show of the season. And yeah, we have to yeah. do it on Zoom. But can our designing student, our design students who have already designed the shows, uh, the first show, uh, can they build a model, take pictures of the model from different angles, get those pictures to the actors in the show who can use them as the virtual background, like I have behind me, uh, create oh, wow. an environment yeah. where they can move in their physical spaces in relationship to a set that's been designed for the show? And can the costume designers, uh, in the first show at least, shop the costumes, send them to the actors at home, and actually yeah. have them in costume performing on yeah. Zoom? So we're all, uh, so Tim, I yeah. think that's the, we're taking over, sorry. Uh, so I'm, I'm done, <laughs> just, just to say, if you're exploring these things, yeah. creative Welcome flow, to Zoom Theater Talk, yeah. Right, but, yeah. but this is what, we're, what I'm trying to explore right now, 
for our audiences that might be remote and for our students who need to get the experience of creating design, even if ultimately it never ends up on a stage, it mm -hmm. still has an impact on what an audience experience is because we've figured out ways to enhance the virtual environment on Zoom. Yeah, and, and what's really fun like about this is that in kind of going off of that idea of, uh, oh, what's the, the phrase? Um, I just lost it. Necessity is the mother of invention or something like that, right? That, that, that new and creative things come out of adversity. Um, you know, your students are figuring out ways to do this differently. When we go back to being able to, to you know, be on stage and be together and things like that, everybody's going to have a new set of vocabulary, a new, a new uh, bucket of, of, of tools and resources that they just had never considered before. Not that they weren't there, uh, but they just hadn't had the, the cause to learn them or even considered, you know, how could we build this with virtual sets or, you know, let's bring in modeling and, and those kind of things. So that's going to be fun. Um, you know, again, everyone's talking about the silver linings of bad things. Uh, and that's and that's just one of them, and that's and that's a and that's a truth that there are silver linings, and and as as something gets expanded and stretched, um, when when that cause for stretching is no longer there, we're still a little bit stretched, and we and we can do new new and different things, and I hope that that'll be a good thing. And just to add to that, that is also the product and and the cause now of student engagement, if they feel like they're inventing things along the way here their engagement will, will double. And that's what I found happened in my classes last term is they were destroyed for a while about being on, on Zoom. And then they said, well, let's see what we can do with Zoom. And then they right. figured out a lot they could do. Joe, you had one more thing to add there? Oh, just that there's, you know, I think it's just echoing that there's a lot of creative solutions going on in the field right now that I think we can point to and look towards that may inform what we do in higher ed. Um, and, and, you know, taking advantage of all of the networks that are out there to tap into those um, and then incorporate them into our classes. You know, there's a lot. The other thing I was thinking earlier about when, you know, the question of pre-recording lectures and how dynamic a speaker, you know, if that's not my training, am I, in, and, and all that stuff. There's a lot of content on the internet that people have already created and a lot that's available through ASU Library that's highly dynamic video content in a lot of our fields. And so I think sometimes, you know, the pressure is to kind of appear as the unique expert in the front of the room, and that's certainly mm -hmm. the old model, and, and to, to make sure that sort of, I, I think there's this, um, there's this uh, semi-conscious, uh, maybe unconscious pressure to sort of prove one's worth in, as the, as the, uh, as the, as the um, expert in the space. But if we open ourselves up to the um, many, many um, resources that are out there, I think we may find not substitutes for everything we might teach in an in-person class, but there's a lot, there's a lot of good video content out there that we could mm -hmm. incorporate into our classes and, and then expose the students to a wider variety of voices, which is always great, you know, especially if it, if it essentially helps diversify the role models they have. So right. which is something I'm always looking to do. Yeah, I like I like that approach to teaching, um, and I and I take that approach when when designing online courses, but also when designing in person courses, is that the instructor does need to be the expert, uh, but not not the only expert, and and that idea that um, the instructor is there to bring their experience. You know, Ken Ken mentioned earlier. You know, what what is it that the instructor? What value does that instructor add if we're you know outsourcing the direct instruction components? Um, and I think one of the, the values that, you, that we add is knowing who to send students to, you know, being that curator, you know, in a yeah. museum, every museum Curation. has a curator and, and the art and, and the artists are a big part of that museum, but the curator is the one that brings it together and makes it make sense. And, and, that, and that knows which artists are to be trusted or which works should be displayed or which things to go together. Um, and I think that's part of the magic of, of teaching is, you're the expert, so you know what sources to pull together. You know what sources to refer your students to. And there's also a big component of modeling there too. Um, we don't want our students to be dependent only on us. I had a teacher tell me once, 
that he, that he felt teaching was a weird job because our, our number one goal is to make ourselves redundant. Like, yes, exactly. <laughs> once our students yep. are done with us, they don't need us anymore. And, and so <laughs> you know, once we've taught them, right? And, and so teaching them where to go, what other sources, you know, I had a, a teacher, an instructor this morning asked me is like, if I, can I put YouTube videos and blog posts and forum posts and things like that? Are those reasonable sources to, to use in my course? And I said, absolutely, because you're teaching them how to find that information in the real world. These are sources that once they leave ASU, that they're going to know where to go for similar types of information or how to do their own research and how to learn on their own because you showed them how to use real world sources. Um, and, and I think that's going to be uh, an incredibly important part of that, that as well. Yeah, I think moving towards the model of thinking of ourselves as curators and facilitators. Um, and, and both of those things are art forms that require a great deal of expertise, but it's often mm -hmm. been expertise that's been invisibilized, uh, especially facilitation expertise, um, I think has been both gendered and invisibilized in a way that is connected. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's a topic for a whole nother, whole nother meeting, I suppose, or, day, or yeah. a lifetime. Yeah, but um, I do think that, you know, making that visible, um, is, and, and making that uh, an explicit part of our process uh, and mm -hmm. a large part of our process and seeing that is, that's how I see my role at this point, at least I'm finding mm -hmm. that useful. Well, we're just passing the hour 10 mark. So I want to honor everybody's time and I want to thank you all for coming. This has been a great conversation. I'm so glad to have a good representation of, of faculty in, in the talk today. So um, just want to, I'm so grateful that you guys uh, took the time to show up and had this conversation. And, and I think it's, it's all important conversation to have uh, that, that as we explore these blending of synchronous and asynchronous, as we explore blending of physical and virtual, um, in re remote and in person, uh, the goal is, is to find what is best for students. And I think as long as we're keeping that, you know, keeping that flame held high, and 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 use that as our as our touchstone as we make these choices about how to how to interact and how to engage our students uh, that we will continue to offer uh, a great uh, a great experience for for our students so that would be great if anyone is watching uh, the video and would like to join us we record and we meet together on Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time and we'd love to have you join us. The Zoom link will be in the video description or wherever you found this video, or just reach out to me, timothy.mckean at asu.edu, and I'll get you all the information you need. Thank you again, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, you so much time. for Enjoy holding the space. Yeah, thanks. You're very welcome. Take care, everyone. Bye.